you must come here to the one. My name is Hassan Alwir, lecturer in architecture and learning in Dundee University. And thanks very much for all of you for coming to our first symposium organized. And uh, I'd really like to say the Guinness Institute for Air Research. Before I start, I will give my colleague, the director of Guinness Institute for Air Research, just a couple of minutes just to introduce what we do in the Guinness Institute. Thank you. Yes. Um, Hello, and, and I'd like to um, welcome you all to this symposium. This is, I think, version two um, that has been organized by Hussam, my colleague Hussam, um, on, on topics related to, to master planning. And um, in particular, to the role of the Charette process in master planning, which as I understand it, is a, a process where a group of, uh, where a community um, uh, pulls, it to, pulls itself together as a, a, as a group, gathers around this charette process to discuss their, um, their well-being and collectively design the way forward. It's a little bit like a campfire bringing people together. Um, I'm going to let Hussam introduce that properly and, and also introduce the speakers, but he did ask me to say um, a word or two about the um, Geddes Institute itself. I'm always um, shocked by this new, the new technology here. That we, if you can't read it on one screen, you can just go and read it on the other. I, I, I'm never quite sure what that's about. <laughs> And, and I also feel like maybe I should say everything twice too, to because we didn't be results. But but any, anyway, I I mean the the, the get I'm, I'm Lawrence Lawrence Holm, and I'm actually one of three directors of the Dennis Institute. There are also there's also um, Barbara Isley in planning and Nick Fife in, in, in geography. And um, it's it's important to mention that because the Dennis Institute was formed. Um, about six years ago now, um, really as an inter interdisciplinary forum involving obviously um, planning, geography, and architecture to um, look at that research in the in the, um, in the built environment. And I should also say that that um, although those are maybe the three core disciplines, um, we have had in the past and continue to have um, an awful lot of involvement from, from other disciplines as well. Um, I mean, right now we've got three Geddes fellows. One of them is an architect, and actually an architect who teaches planning. Um, the, the, uh, another is a uh, digital artist and activist with a particular interest in cities and how digital media is, uh, in effect, can function as a kind of charrette process. And then finally, an economist. So we've got, you know, uh, uh, an architect, uh, 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 an economist, and a digital artist, essentially. So, it's right now. And, um, so we, we do try to be a rather broad, a broad um, forum. Now, um, the I, I, I've used that word forum a couple of times. I should just say that that um, in, in addition to that, I mean, and when I say forum, I mean groups like this. who said has been extremely influential and keeping the foreign role of, of the Institute alive with, with, with his, um, a number of uh, symposiums that he has done under the auspices of the Institute in the past. I mean, these two are simply the last two of uh, a number of things he's done in the past. Uh, but in addition to that, we, we also um, uh, showcase the research work of individual members of, of the staff of and do occasionally also do research projects. Um, the last research project we did um, for the Arts and Humanities Research Council um, was based, was really a scoping study, a very kind of small project, um, but a scoping study which argued very strongly to that it was in order to address questions of well-being in the environment, you really need to bring together not just spatial practitioners, planners and architects and urbanists, but also draw on the disciplines of psychology and psychoanalysis 
who really do have, have really developed a very sophisticated discourse about well-being, um, not necessarily well-being in the environment, but well-being in general. Uh, and um, I, I hope um, that we um, are able to follow the research to sort of take some of those things. But anyway, I should give it back to, to Hussein. Um, I should just say that I do recognize a number of people here. It's always good to, to, to see um, faces that can, um, I simply recognize from around Dundee or, or, or who are um, who participated in, in previous um, previous events. So I should probably um, stop. I say it would be a minute to double at least two minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Just first of all, I'm very pleased to see. Uh, very multidisciplinary team I could see in this room between architecture, planning, and actually even geography. And also we have the community of practice on board as well. We've got a lot of activities. And I, one of the things I want to say, every individual in this room will have a role to play in this symposium. So it is not only about the speakers, it is as well you as well what you want to say because we will have little exercise for all of you. Before I start, I just want, and I promise it will be only one slide, before I hand on to my colleague, the Director of Urbanism in Architecture, Design Scotland, David Lola. He just arrived, I believe. <laughs> but only one slide, I promise, based on the narrative I propose, or and not only me, I propose, Collective narrative, we wrote it together with the speakers and with my colleague David as well. Now, everyone talked about master planning. What is it, master planning? Just briefly. And if every individual in this room knows what is master planning or what is a good master planning, why they fail or why they, they, they claim it is fail? Did we learn from what works and what doesn't work? in regards to master planning. And by the way, I mean to put it master planning process, not a master plan, because master plan to me is out of date. It does remind me of the blueprint where every time the architect claims, oh, I could solve it. That's it. It is building, it is spaces, and that's it. It, is, it should be a continuous process. And this is the message I, I, I believe and I share with all of you. Master planning is not about installing solutions. It is a continuous performance. And how we keep the value of this performance in terms of keeping the delivery and value when we achieve value of what I say, social, economic, and environmental value. So it is not only about instant solution. Another thing is, what are we trying to do with master planning process, especially within the current economic asperity we face? With the current pressure we have, market economy, must market economy and investment should facilitate market development. And this is one thing I'm trying to say. For each single pound we, should, we spend, we should think about five times of that pound what we will achieve in return to the community, to us, and public life. So basically, building efficiency and resources. And doing that, I'm not saying we need a new policies. I'm saying we need a new way of thinking, especially when things to do with the early vision in the process of master planning. Because no one will collaborate, no one will collaborate unless we really make an impact worthwhile by understanding the visioning process. And when I say visioning process, I am not talking about 3D, 3D dimension of architecture. Because master planning, not anymore a collection of buildings and spaces, it is a network of integration. And when I say integration, it's not only physical connection, it is as well integration with economy, social, and so on. So basically, that's leading me to what I call it, yes, collaboration between all of us, community, <coughs> stakeholders, and community. But do we really understand the impact of what we propose at the beginning, not by the end? So understanding the impact.
back of what we deliver as stakeholders with the community right from the beginning, not by the end of the process. And that's leading to those interesting key questions, which is interestingly, they are the key, the three, the three key words in the three titles the speakers propose to us in terms of what works and why. Value, place, and how, and how the positions master planning as a tool to guide the master, the whole process of master planning, which is, I, as, I said, as I said, I, I repeat, it's a continuous process. And that leads us to, main, to two main questions, and I will leave it to my colleague to introduce the little exercise for all of you. There. Thank you. 
at the very back, point at the back. I'm observing, I'm not oh, taking right, the right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I only spotted you there at the end. OK, we were full of volunteers. Just in the middle of the two dead, the ten minute corner shot and the middle of the time. Just in the Oh, we actually might be, might be, we can't agree on might be process easy in this case. Okay, you said it's a master of the planning process. I'm an architect, I don't know what that process is. Okay. I'm trying to sell it like you, but I need to find out what the master of the planning process is. You know what the benefit is, and you know what the process is. Right. I don't think it's higher than high No, no, so it's fair point, so it's kind of, we're, we're, we're using the term, and not everybody understands, we can't say the benefit of that process is like, so it's clear about that. It's a very, yeah, master of planning. Okay, so let's get specific. It depends, what, it depends what the, the, the project development is. It depends on that is. Okay, so we're, we're, we're saying we're be specific and be specific in use of language. Okay, good. Just go in here. Yourself? Um, you said social integration and connection. Social integration and connection. Okay, for everyone. Well,
talks about MPA looking to do, benefit to what, what do we mean? So very much linked to the first question here. Let's be clear, let's get that in. It's not important to start off the product because we've come through a period where we don't know what we're talking about, what we're doing, or who's involved. So that's part of what we mean clear. And let's make this simple to make clear, to make the questions provocative, make them clear, to make them challenging. The second part of the purpose. So what is it we're trying to do? The master plan itself is a device to organize things. What does it achieve? So the proposition from Kevin is around, it achieves a path to create place, medium term place making, but it's not the total process itself. And there's something interesting from Rob's presentation around learning and also positioning. I was at an event at Creative Scotland, Rob, which is around talent, talent growing in Scotland. And the first question was failure. How you use failure to drive learning. If the proposition here is that 94% of master plans fail, that means that 6% succeed. So we have 94% of stuff to learn from to make that quota work better. To make that place making thing work a lot better for a lot more people to get these outcomes that we're talking about. The propositions will come in different ways, there'll be lots of discussion, and hopefully we um, find that clarity and value and integration and confidence, lots of things will come out of it. What would be really important is to use this forum to talk and to challenge so that at the end of it we have more clarity, more confidence around these values. So I'm going to stop, introduce Professor Brian Evans, uh, who also is a, is a colleague in a number of dimensions, a uh, professor of urbanism at Glasgow School of Art, outstanding professional, Professor Brian Evans. Thank you. Very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, you need to talk amongst yourself for two minutes while we quickly revert to the technology. I'll, I'll say a word or two though by, by way of introduction. Is that one? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, thank you for that um, introduction, Kieran, and, and also for telling me what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> and, and so two, there's two versions of what I'm going to say, and there's the one that takes like two minutes that he's just done, um, or there's the one that takes half an hour that involves a lot of slides. Um, which I'm going to do, um, but basically it's the same, uh, it's, it's the same, uh, same presentation. And the other thing I think is quite interesting, and I'd say the event that um, Deirdre was referring to the other evening, um, that's my tiny desktop, the other that he's referring to, in stereo, <laughs> um, uh, was freezing cold, but it was also kind of, um, it was also kind of interesting.
All right, I could do, I could talk about something I'm going to talk about at the end, at the beginning, um, uh, because uh, there, there's, um, this is this sort of kind of interesting thing about who could what to who uh, to talk about this afternoon. So I received an invitation to talk about <coughs> how can sustainable master plans create value for local people. Um, and one of the things I was going to talk about at the end, while the technology is thinking about things, um, it is English usage, actually, uh, which is particularly important when we are um, working in international circumstances. And increasingly, that means at home as well, I think, when often we're dealing with multicultural um, circumstances at home too. And how do we expect these words to <laughs> Cosmology, and how do we expect them towards, towards the play? Oh dear, dear, right. Comprehensive 
damage in the middle of the Second World War, um, this is a sort of 1940s, 50s climate. Um, look at these spaces uh, and look at the way they change over time. Look at, for example, the introduction of the thermoplastic paint, the, uh, you know, the, the bus shelter. Um, we've intruded into the garden here, built a wee space. Um, we're doing a few things around about here. People are using surface, the, uh, the lane now. It's not the top of the streets uh, anymore. In the winter time, we're, pu we're putting in some sewers. Um, we've uh, introduced a tram system. Uh, the trees have reduced a wee bit. Um, garden's still okay. Uh, these things are still okay. The wind lorries have come in, that kind of thing. Um, continues on through the winter. We've got a bit of demolition, movement going on, more infrastructure coming about. Um, oh, this is a bit more like the towns we know now. So the garden's gone now, taking the building off here, uh, off the edge. We're moving the historic building. We're down to a sort of totemic tree um, in the public space. Um, and then people are getting a bit sort of, you know, uncertain about this. Players come to town. Uh, we're, uh, we're changing some stuff, we've got a new edge here. Kodak have moved into the edge of the garden and we're building a few things. Um, and then people are getting kind of act off about it now, so they're starting to say something about what's happening to the historic town. Nonetheless, we're doing a number of things. The public square is uh, recognised by the uh, heraldic um, uh, Henry Moore. Um, and uh, here we are, here's the uh, town uh, that we know and love today. And a lot of what we're doing is dismantling this and trying to go back to some of the things that we know and love. And I was delighted to see when I got out of the station today that finally, after all of my working life, Sir Michael of Galloway has been able to dismantle a couple of um, overbridges uh, that have messed up the uh, water from here um, in the Lee. And that's taken, I think, about four or five uh, decades. So there's something about understanding the historical palimpsest, the Zuka, um, the, the, the historic amphitheatre in the centre that remains there even to today, the Roman amphitheatre. You know, nobody's slain in there anymore as far as I know, unless it's a mafia head. Um, but, it's, but it's fine, you know, it's there and it forms, it forms the town. So we need to think about these things when we are working with our own place um, and working with the time. Uh, geography that's associated with it, how things fit into the landscape, and so I wanted to talk today about small scale and how these processes fit by or impact on small scale events like Montrose, uh, like Stonehaven, um, like in Maruri, these are small towns we've worked in and tried to envisage. Wick, um, uh, you know, the, the, the small towns in Fife, uh, mid, mid, mid term, mid century. Uh, but the institutionalized nature of things, and then go into output of some of these processes and how these processes have come about. By the way, Mr. Sam, will you give me five minutes, please? Uh, and you can take the extra that I took that I wasted with the technology to cut out of me, so I can talk a little faster. So this is, this is some work we did in Norway, in a place that's very similar to a lot of the communities that we know and love. Um, in West Scotland, for example, same kind of landscape, um, same kind of setting, you know, and the issues that they need to face are very similar to many of the issues that we need to face. Improving accessibility, declining population, how do you retain the young? How do you bring them back, develop the tourism offer, achieve this balance, you know, in, improving uh, employment opportunities? You, you recognize these things, you recognize the drivers, you recognize the sort of place and the, 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 the uh, kind of uh, animation that it takes, the precedents that you use um, are, are very, very relevant and, and people recognize them, know them uh, and work with them. Some are all and in sky, for example. We're all highly relevant to working with local people to understand the drivers in that place, the way they saw themselves, the way they wanted to see themselves uh, in the future so that we could finally put pen to paper and look at, look at this place, look at how it comes about, look at its qualities. Um, this, this is near Tim Basin in Inverness, um, where a similar sort of exercise was undertaken. This time we're using models and things and so on and so forth. And I just, want, I just wanted to browse this with you. So I'm not so much concerned to explain the details of any one of these, but 
but rather just use these as tools and case studies to set the thing up. So, so that was that was another you know another way of going going through something. Town of Scunthorpe in Yorkshire, the Yorkshire Renaissance panel that both Kevin and I were members of, uh, where they set up a they set up a, 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 a regeneration structure they called the Renaissance and. and I always remember that the, 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 the guy who led the program had a business card um, and it said his name and underneath it it said Head of Renaissance. And I thought that'd be great if you had to go to a conference in Florence, wouldn't it? Uh, what are you Head of Renaissance? You know, they go, oh, I have one of them, right? Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, the, the whole geography of the town through an, an engagement process, worked up an understanding of the structure of the town, worked up a raft of projects, gateways, its context, and, and actually through working with local people became ambitious um, about linking uh, the town to the River Trent and using the, the fact that English nature needed to inundate areas for flood attenuation to say, well, let's, let's use that as balancing lakes and let's bring the town to the river. The energetic the corridor in the northeast of Scotland, um, sort of transport strategy, all the way from uh, from Aberdeen up to uh, up to Peterhead, um, the whole corridor, the towns, its landscape, um, the live work story that could be built, um, how we could use uh, fuels to uh, do something into the hydrogen highway, could we introduce uh, hydrogen packages there, so on and so forth, working through all, all the places and towns through to the grass market in Edinburgh, which is a heroic space, but when we started working there with a car park um, and working with local people to try and do something about that, see them reflected in the process, have them work with the formulation of principles uh, behind the driver of the design, getting people to, to sign up to. And indeed, things like this win awards, but one of the things that was, was had one of the nicest moments, actually, uh, in my work over the past 20 years um, was that um, Scottish enterprise were doing one of these wonderful things uh, that economists do, which is called an ex post assessment. How do you explain that to people? But they do, they do an ex ante, means beforehand, and they do an ex post. And for Sam, you were asking a question the other night about how you measure things. Well, that's all about measuring it, measuring the baseline before you start, measuring it afterwards. And they were Partly because we did this through Chirac process, they invited local people in um, and they were asking about the performance of this space since it's been implemented um, and since, they, um, since it's in use and since local people are using it. And um, one of the local people there pulled out the, um, pulled out the, the work from the Chirac and pulled out these design principles and they said, and these principles were developed in partnership with the community. And I, I responded to the questionnaire about what I think about the grass market as to whether or not it delivered on these principles and whether or not you guys actually delivered on your promises. And that was fantastic um, for me because that always <coughs> doesn't happen uh, in these processes. And we use all of this kind of stuff as well, of course. And it's about <coughs> starting with people um, in, in the process and, and working that through. Um, I had some things in here about other towns, but I'm going to go past that because I want to get to um, I want to get to uh, the, the, the thing about the Chirac process. Um, and some of that was about towns are not alone and there are transition towns and there's cheap and slow and, and so on and so forth. And I just simply wanted to say that as all of our work out and all of these projects were all delivered through the Charette process and the public engagement program. Um, and many people here will know it, many people here will use it, many people here will participate in it. Um, but that goes, walks people through, walks local people through um, the whole uh, process in a seven day uh, process. Um, the preparation in advance, we call it community animation. Reach out, if you like, reaching out to the community, finding out who the community are, talking to them, talking with them, um, finding out whether or not they will come, uh, going through familiarization procedures with them, going through familiarization procedures with the team.
team, uh, getting the stakeholders <coughs> involved in the process, getting them out for <coughs> many times, going through ideas, working with people, drawing over the board, um, reporting back, talking, uh, working with the public, the school children, capturing everything people say, feeding that back into the process, working hard, capturing the quotes, playing it back to them, exposing the issues that are truly challenging um, for people, finding where consensus exists and what the dilemmas are uh, in the process, and then building all of that through, uh, through the process into establishing a series of themes that people are comfortable with, and then let them see you working with these themes, play their time back to them, so they recognize it. This was, this was interesting, you know, the, the, the um, Tour of Britain came to the movies, and um, I, uh, I thought that it was interesting. I couldn't go, it was just a couple of days before we started the charrette, um, and I thought it was great. Here's the piece, on the telly, or something nice, you know. And I got there, and I had a meeting with the traders, uh, with the team of the meeting with the traders, and they were livid about this. They said, you know, yeah, they closed the street for four hours, my takings went down. And I was, I, was, I was working with them, saying, you know, the priest has only ever been on the television for the last 10 years because it floods. And here was the priest on the TV for something amazing. Don Freeze, Bradley Wiggins, same picture, you know. And they haven't thought about that. And that's the kind of degree of alienation that you can get. And if you're dealing with these small towns and you're dealing with issues like this, you have to find ways of reconciling these things. I think it's a form of counselling, actually. Um, and playing it back, you know, the degree to which our towns and cities are unfriendly. One of the things I always do is go and record all of the things where they say you can't play football, you can't play golf, take your dog home, you know, stay here for only 20 minutes. Every town in Britain, certainly every town in Scotland, you can go out you can find hundreds of this and you get a cheer from people because they go, oh, here's somebody who's listening or thinking about it. And so you play all of that, you deal with the stuff, you show them the time, um, you play it back. Most of the people who are transparent, they see you working, you, 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 you indulge in funny things about how you can bring these through, how you can animate it, put it into three dimensions, use techniques of visualization, all that sort of stuff in order to be able to show the way change can come about, manage the expectations, produce scales of plans that are appropriate to places, um, show the way the changes can be, explain the dynamics of the town, uh, and, and then very importantly talk about the way things can go forward, which I think is fundamental. Now, I have rattled through all of this. I just, I just wanted it to be a kind of kaleidoscope of images to say there were a number of projects from the regional scale through to a public square, small scale urbanity in Scotland. All of them delivered through a public engagement, envisioning, um, uh, and charrette process that kept that process going. But not all of them are successful. And just before I conclude, how am I doing for time? Okay. Um, I, 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 I do this one, you know, and I put apologies to dear but people have heard me on this on a number of occasions. You know, this is actually, and I, I feel sorry for the you know, this is King Malcolm the First, the Canmore Dynasty, who I think is probably um, Scotland's greatest urbanist. Um, and I feel sorry for him because there wasn't, we didn't have Twitter. Um, or um, uh, image consultants. Well, I think they did have image consultants in the in the 12th century, you know. But I mean, this is back when kings were kings, you know, meaningful. I mean, the guy ruled the country, you know, and they had big black horses, big black coats, black hair. You know, maybe that was his architect. But anyway, they, they you know they, they were really and and he gets painted like this, you know. But. He decided he needed to do what kings do, and that's build some towns, ideally get the bishops into the towns, and put his sheriff in there to keep an eye on the bishops, and keep an eye on the marketplace. 
And then the other thing to do was build a wall around the town, not, I may say, to protect the people, but so you could tax them on the way in, because what he wanted to do was tax the people. So he built a series of towns for his people. And the way he did that, and built places like Elgin, Crail, my favorite this one, Montrose, right, was he went to guys he knew, and he commissioned a process, and he got some guys over from the low countries. He had a design competition, and he said, I gather you guys are quite good at building towns. Great, okay, and he got them to do proposals, so they gave them together a little Right, okay, you can have Elgin to do, off you go, but you have to work with the local people, because um, I'm a bit, well, I don't want building, I want to invest money in these and have them flood them, right? So if you're going to build these towns, and so here's a model, your, your Royal Highness and Sirness. Um, we'll, we'll build this wall, you know, we'll give people rigs so they can protect themselves and we'll have a market. Oh, that's fine, okay. So they had a model and they were set out to deliver the model in the local place. And they were billeted, these guys who were building the Bastides in Europe, got billeted with local people, and they then said, um, we were thinking there's a crossroads here. Um, so we were thinking we would build a town here and said, well, you know, the thing is the river that's floods. So I would I would um, I'd move it a wee bit away. If you see if you build it right beside the river, you're gonna be knee deep every year, you're gonna be knee deep and you don't want to do that. There's not one of King Malcolm's High Street's floods. Not one. There's thirty-five Royal Boroughs commissioned by that guy. Not one of the high streets floods, even today with climate change. And I think that's interesting. After that, you know, so they had a charrette with the local people. And then, after that, he said, well, I better see what you've got to have done. So you better come back and let me know what your design is, where you're putting it, and why. So he had them in for design review. And after the design review, marked up the plans, off they went and laid it out. And, and the purpose of this is that there's not really that much new, I think. And if we listen to history and we work with these things, then maybe, um, and we work with these processes, we might be able to change the balance between roles 94 and 6%. So, uh, breakfast canter through. Um, how can sustainable master plans create value for local people? Um, and I started off saying that there are here five words that are the most overused words in the lexicon of the place. <coughs> sustainable, Master plan, value, local people. Rearrange in the following well known phrase or saying. Sustainable, what does it mean? Well, for me, it means capable of enduring. And in particular, I think, to me, it means decoupling economic growth from materials use. And you can, I believe that's possible. This proposition about prosperity without growth is balderdash. I think you need to have growth, but you have to decouple growth from materials use. And there's some evidence that post-industrial societies can achieve that. So that's one proposition or one thing. Secondly, master plan. Well, it's a framework through to a plan. David has started to talk about this today already. Vision through to process. Um, but certainly, in my book, it's got to be a consensual direction of travel. If you don't have a consensual direction of travel, you will get nowhere, no matter how grand it is or no matter how modest it is. Value. Oh, that's another one, isn't it? Eh? Oh, did this create value? I think you have hard value, which is measured in terms of money, and I think you have soft value, which is measured in terms of benefit. And I'm talking about quality of life, beauty. You know, it's valuable for its beauty. It's valuable for its health-giving qualities. And you could argue that the summation of soft uh, value creates hard value, and the other way. So there's a symbiotic relationship between these. My favorite is local people. You know, this is the ubiquitous, gratuitous, <laughs> right? People I get, what's a local person? Are you born there, live there, work there? Do you live and work there? These days, if we're being politically correct, it means you're not a professional, 
and you're probably not a male of working age unless you're maybe an artisan, you know. And you could actually argue that in some people's parlance, global people is a euphemism for poor people. So I think you've got to be careful about that. But I talk about people who live and work there, if you like. Although, when we're making master plans and we're making processes for people who live and work there, bear in mind that they live and work there and they care about the place. They care about the place for reasons of self-interest, because it's their house and their job. You know? So it's not entirely a neutral proposition, actually, uh, when you're dealing with these things. Nonetheless, if you have that kind of working uh, definition of these things, in my book, these are necessary criteria for the proposition. You have to have people with capability in the process. And, and somebody the other night, I think, misunderstood me and, and they said, Look, there's a lot of capacity um, in, the, in the process. Um, and, and I said, no, I wasn't talking about capacity. I was talking about <laughs> I, I, I was talking about capability. You know, I, I, I think one of the things that's always intrigued me about design um, as a profession and related, less related to medicine, for example, you know, you could have a medical examination, you know, a discussion with people who would say, well, I think, um, Mr. Evans, you know, your legs a bit. Uh, we're going to have to, you know, uh, do something with your knee. You're getting on a bit. We're going to. And you go, oh, right, I understand that now. Can I have a go? You know, you, don't, you get in somebody who knows how to do something with your knee. So we have this sort of proposition that it's fine to have a go. No, it's not, actually. We really need highly skilled people who are tuned to the realization of community aspiration as opposed to the expression of self in these processes. You most certainly need engagement. It's, it's a, a pre-definition, de facto requirement if you want to have any kind of value, soft or hard, through a process. I certainly think you need leadership. You need people who have capability, who can lead through the process. Because this is not a question of saying, nice town you have here, what would you like? That is absolute bullshit, right? You need to say, tell me about your town. Let me hear about your town. What do you like about your town? What do you not like about your town? What are the problems? What do you dream about for your town? Um, what are the solutions for your town? And you do that with local people. You do that with the businesses. You do it with the traders. You do it with the stakeholders. You work on all of these things. And then you try and work through consensus and dilemma. And you need leadership and you need capability to do that. It is a highly skilled process. We don't teach it, we need to teach it. It's absolutely <coughs> essential. And it's only by doing that sort of thing that you can build, in my opinion, the trust that's necessary to carry something through, all right? And then finally, you need staying power. Because you can't just arrive and say, hello, four million, I'm here, I'm going to save you. I mean, bollocks. And we've done so many of these things. So now when we start the process, we start by asking ourselves the question, what capability is there here to deliver on this? Is there anybody here with the capability? They could be a local person. They could be a business person. They could be somebody in the local authority. But they need to have that capability. We have done a number of these projects recently, including one Russia the funding, I may, might say, by the Scottish Government um, to get in a town. I think it personally has a lot less chance of becoming a successful master plan than the one in the Greece. And the reason for that is the one in the same process, uh, same kind of involvement and all the rest of it, but I think there's people with capability in the Greece to carry, pick up the ball and run with it. Uh, small town equivalents of my gallery. Um, for example. And I think that's absolutely essential. So these may not be sufficient conditions for, all for successful master plan, but they are certainly necessary conditions. Exactly. Thank you. And I apologize for the
we will leave, of course, the questions in the end to define these with these five now and questions in your hand. Now, we will start the whole second speaker, Professor Ethan Mann. He will talk about, I think, what he dare to refer to is the various. that some people. And the risk of that is that we go back to the default urbanism, 
it's not even urbanism. It's, it's mining fields and stuffing them full of houses, or, or the same could be applied, uh, for instance, to retail sheds or other kind of business premises elsewhere. But it's a default minimum that does not constitute meat, not any discernible, meaningful place. Uh, does anyone know where that is, for instance? <coughs> exactly. It could be anywhere, and probably is, because it's been repeated exactly the same in three or four times around Scotland and probably England as well. To follow my old boss, <coughs> Francis Tibbles, from when I was a young planner, place matters most. Look up, making people friendly places, his book. That's the argument. So whatever our background, engineers, architects, developers, surveyors, planners, place matters most for people. So the last department I'm talking about is the basic aspects. I'm not going to concentrate on them all equally, but there is the spatial master planning, the space frame, the synthesis of different elements and aspects in some kind of spatial context. But there is also master programming. There is a sequence. I've talked about this intergenerational, looking 4, 5, to 10, 15 years, maybe more of a master planning process and end up. That's looking at phasing and milestones to that. But there is also, crucially, critically, institutional coordination and cooperation. This collaboration element that you heard about earlier in the afternoon of different stakeholders, landowners, community players, particularly a range of public agencies and institutions are working together. Why? Why are we doing it? I think right at the beginning, the point uh, being made on the slide that uh, you sent me up was think clearly about the strategic intent. If it's relevant still to do master planning, even if it's to prepare for a future boom or address regeneration during the downturn, be clear why we're doing it, what its purpose is, whether it has a status that is legally backed or it's informal, what's that? There are different kinds of plan. What kind of plan is it? I'm going to go through that in a moment. And what are the controls and, and the components? So what are we doing? What's going to be in it? And think that through beforehand without necessarily having all the answers. But it's exactly the point that a number of people say is you have to have a clear intent. In terms of any area that you're considering, what are the roles and functions of that going to be? Is it a dormitory suburb? Is it a town centre? Is it an employment area? And is it hopefully a mix of a lot of those elements? What are the uses and activities going to be to evolve? And this can apply to new development or regenerated. That's Dalmarin in the east end of Glasgow. That has both new components and old. What kind of economy and community will be there now and over time? What kind of involvement and participation is there? That one had traveling show people in it who some of them worked their way during the year, others were there, and they were being moved around within that site. What's the appearance going to be, and what kind of fixes and variables? I'm going to pick up on that in just a moment. Sorry, I should have said the last one there. I don't want me to just pass on it, but what are the sustainability elements, whether they're ecological or energy or wildlife? <laughs> one of the quest first questions was around why, what the purpose is. It could be a vision to guide future change, a pretty picture. It could be something that reconciles and synthesizes physical, economic, and social issues. It could be, actually, a blueprint for development. You literally go out and build it just like that, like Versailles or something like that. But it almost never is these days. It's more likely to be a spatial diagram, even a PR, a marketing illustration that goes in a newspaper or a brochure. It's often, in, in the terms that Brian was uh, discussing, and I, I will present a tool for mediation between different parties. So it's not a singular master plan, it's a master planning process that involves community, public agencies, developers, landowners, and so on. It could be a mechanism to create and distribute value and, and share values and, and aspirations. And ideally, it should be a focus on delivering key place outcomes. It's not just a collection of jigsaw things, it's got to be delivering something better. And it can be a vehicle, a very positive vehicle for engagement. Huge history of master planning. I'm just going to pick up some key themes. That is the blueprint kind of approach, although that wasn't James Craig's original plan. The original one was a Union Jack. But that was able to accommodate one of the Brian's purpose projects, new things recently, but the intensity of the plan is to for 250 years. Here's one that does have that, the Union Jack. I'm sure the American didn't want to say that, but the long form plan for Washington. 
is still there. It's still underlying Washington. It's subsisted all that time, even though the buildings are much higher than the original where we first built. The underlying plan is still there as, as, as a classical and neoclassical mode. The modernist versions of the Gabuzi from the 20s and 30s, and his being read years of uh, successive work, he misunderstood urbanism and urbanity. And a lot of those, and you'll see them uh, in, in Dundee and Anarene and Sheffield and Burnley and Glasgow, they're pulling them down. Because they don't work as urbanity, but there was that model. And here, where in the last decade, we've had lots of these by Will Allsop in every conceivable uh, run down and off of England This is built. And here is. Bradford. I'll come back to that in a moment. But they can still have influence, but a lot of the time they were wacky and creative. At the same time, the last 20 years, we've got the, the counterpoint tradition of new urbanism. Uh, this is Dorchester and the Prince of Wales one, uh, and the, the Andrews Domain one, it's one way near the next. But master planning has different components, different traditions, different elements, but all of those last and endure over a period and have an impact. So what I'm arguing, basically, is that a master plan and a master planning process is a contingency frame. It's a holding uh, position. But things will change, and it holds at different levels. It's a bit like a Heathrow or a major airport, a holding line for, for different aircraft at different packs, with different fixes and different tolerances and flexibilities, whether they're for roads or housing or open space or park. So yes, for those of you who are architects, it is designed, and I was designing this but it's much more than design as in design of buildings or design of roads or design of homes. It's much more complex. I know most of my architect friends would prefer a clear site, clear field, and have their own imagination and not have all these constraints that seem to be carried forward from decades before. But that isn't reality, particularly if we're dealing with urbanism as we know it, with towns, with cities, with neighborhoods, and even villages. So here's my key point. Spatial strategy, high level, and then there are successor levels, development framework and master plan, and there's even levels below that. So spatial strategy is broad brush, sets out key moves and intent. It's basically what you draw with beer on a table in the pub or on a napkin. It's that kind of thing where you're capturing ideas and spatial configurations or perhaps options, like the one on the left there, uh, sorry, your right, uh, the one that, that's options for slide down the center. And it may be about routes and connections. It's the framework, it's the principles, but it's not the detail. It's the broad brush element. Here is Motherwell and Wishaw conceptualized in a different frame, knitting in Raymond's grid. So that's the blobogram. That is still part of the master planning process. But below that sits the development framework that sets down much more specific fixes in terms of parcels, uses, infrastructure, and begins to think about three dimensions and involves more thinking, more drawing, uh, more research behind it. So here is a knitting together of the key development opportunity sites in Croydon Town Centre, or, or another one from Newcastle, the land parcel and the landscape frame uh, there. Here's one for Renfrew Riverside, where they key parcels and streets, but they're not fixed, they're not rigid, they're not near that, there yet, and there's not all the development specified. In this one in Glasgow, which Mike will know because it's next to Crane Street, here's the thinking for Lauriston, building on the old streets that were there, but then, if we go back, those streets were lost, but they're still under the ground with services and infrastructure below ground. So it's not just about designing above ground, it's thinking about what's underground and creating a place working for that. In this instance of development framework, it upped in the western expansion from uh, the core of Northampton. So the core of Northampton is in here, in there. So this site was evolved. This was done as a charrette, worked up over several cycles. So I led this multidisciplinary team of uh, working on it. Sorry, just go back. Uh, and we evolved uh, from that example of sticking a road through and selling off parcels to the one that was more of a kind of village street, more traditional in feel and character. That's what people wanted. Here's the one that we worked on with Andrews Brady at Aberdeen as part of the SSCI Charette. Anybody here from Aberdeen, this is the Bridge of Dawn. Can you see the red light? Is it showing up the red light? No. Westward, north of the road, north westward expansion, a series of neighborhoods, but everything connects up in terms of uh, streets and so on. 
and that's the more intensive part of the site coming forward. I wanted to show the next cycle of this, but it's not going to be public until the end of this month, so I'm not in a position to do so. That has changed. There's a recent iteration coming out. Those of you who've been following it or who are interested. Um, but that's a drawing. It's a development framework. It may look like a detailed master plan, but it isn't there yet. The detailed master plan actually comes at the next level, which is much more specific in terms of relationships, uh, uses, uh, everything from height to materials. This is some of the little Keynes plan that we worked on. Um, it, it, it also applies to gardens, public space, landscape, uh, suds, and, and things like that. Here's the one that, that I, I was showing earlier uh, from Renfrew Riverside, where the parks, the houses, the potential waterways uh, are all illustrated. So it's an, another level of specificity. You can't necessarily go out and build straight from it, but it's getting closer to it. Here are some examples where you kind of different kinds of housing as part of the frontage. The one on the left is a street individualization from uh, Rochester on Medway. This is back to the one, you can see how it's progressing. This one in Northampton, it's tightening up from the previous one. At this level, we're beginning to look at houses, streets, parking spaces, trees, it's getting more real. And the whole thing is coming up. So that's why it's a process. It's not a single plan. It, the level of detail and testing takes it all the way here to looking at story heights. So it's four story, three story, two story, uh, depending on its, its position. And also in terms of functions and uses being specified. All of this before any of the architecture is considered because it hasn't even been sold off by uh, the government agency at that point. The next level below master plans are where you can deconstruct the components and start to do deals, uh, to control, to guide, um, to incentivize sometimes landowners, developers, designers to do different parts. So you're beginning to put design briefs and design codes, and the issue there is often to do with the legal backing uh, within the conveyancing process or within the planning process. So I'm not really going to say more about that later if you want to. You can be talking about flood attenuation intervention which is very important. Brian's referred to the, the King David uh, uh, Times all around Scotland. This same sort of thing is having to be addressed all around Europe, except the parts which are, are rising in Scandinavia. That, sorry, that one I should have said is the Dalmarnock one we talked about, and that, that is actually on the site now. So we did this with the community, um, and, and that work with the flood attenuation is being addressed now. Sorry. What are we controlling? Is it just the grid of streets? Is it block size, scale? Is it building heights? The rhythm of the plots, we tend to have lost the plot. In the UK-based planning, certainly, in other parts of the world, the plot or the lot is critical. So what are the components that we're trying to guide? Is it integration of roads, footpaths, uh, walkways? I'm trying to get away from this risk scenario. The one at the top is a risk scenario where everything's plonked down separately and connected up. That's the heights and issues control. And it isn't just heights and issues of buildings, it's what this looks like and feels like as a street. What are the ratios? What is the feel and character at different times of the day when the sun comes through? And we did this kind of work in the Upton work I showed you. All of this done with the community in workshops, in charrette process. We conceptualized different kinds of streets and drew them up. Five years later, that was what was built. We didn't know what the architecture was going to look like. But look at that, that's pretty well what we planned in terms of streets. I don't know, I don't mind what the, the attitudes are around the architecture, because to some extent these are volume house builders being persuaded to do something different than something better than they've done before. And it can be more contemporary in terms of style and design and different approaches to such uh, and so on. But the key is to think about these different components and elements, including the parking, including testing the parking, uh, in detail, you can actually specify not only the parking ratio but its position. Uh, you can look at the buildings that are built for not only in height, you can begin to specify colors and tones. I know a lot of people don't like that, particularly those of you who are architects may not like that, but in all the places that work and hang together, that we've been visiting and studying in the last few years at the Academy, they hang together because either traditional materials or tones or colors work. Uh, this one is from Denmark, traditional, the modern material, the traditional colors. The other two are from Scotland. Occasionally, you give people a palette, um, and they say, yeah, we've got the fenestration, we've got square windows in there somewhere, and yes, we've got a color palette, and we'll use the law, thank you very much. This one is from uh, Hamburg, in the EGLA project just south of Hamburg. You can address in a plan, where the solar panels can be used, 
uh, and how and where to minimize their, their negative impact. Here, suds and water management can be planned, and that was in the plan, in the brief, and then it's taken forward and implemented. And it can be done in different ways. Having these slides and images can help people conceptualize what they would like to see happen in their neighborhood. This is the, um, the Glasgow Delmarnock one here. The critical factor in Russia is much more specific and legalistic in places like Germany, and they're much more specific not only in building lines, but on building heights. Here, we tend to be fearful of the discretionary system we have in the UK. Scotland, England, Wales, uh, and Northern Ireland too have this, where the developers tend to want to get as much density, intensity, and volume as they can so they like to leave it flexible, uh, uh, and uh, often we need to know that it's going to work for transport, for schools, uh, for shops, for a whole range of things like that. We might want to be specific. But here in the <coughs> city, this is a back in Hamburg, central Hamburg in here, in historic Hamburg. Uh, half the city I visited a few weeks ago. And the point about that is they were much more specific about heights and building lines. They didn't let all the developers or designers just do what they wanted. It wasn't a free for all. And they didn't get that kind of consistency all year with different architects and designers without having a very specific design code. They did have to raise it a whole floor above sea level so to have the flood protection in for, for high sea level. They've got to both the river and, and the tide to be able to do it. <coughs> the plan can specify kinds of residential treatments. It can consider whether it's permanent occupancy or temporary, rented, or, or home ownership, and that can change. Like this example from Salford where we work, where it was all going to be social rented, it is now a mix of home ownership and uh, shared equity and social rented. And it can even, with it, it can variations of style. I really just want to put this one up to say, all of these are date from 1996. All of, so there is an issue about what kind of style is appropriate locally. One's in London, one's in Doncaster, one's in Scotland. So you can vary. This is the same space from the charrette that we did, drawing up, discussing with people. In the end, that one became more influential. But that one, which was a story higher, had a different level of car parking, had a different kind of occupancy because it was more flats and apartments than that lower rise one. So all these things affect the kind of place and what kinds of things you might wish to control and cope. Not just heights house types as well. But perhaps most critical coming back to one of the earliest questions at the beginning was, is this a real community? It's not just buildings and built form. Are we providing for life, for community needs? Are we providing schools, nurseries, community halls, library facilities, shops, leisure space, as an example, that people can have a quality of life, whether we're refurbishing old or we're creating new? Because a lot of the time, developers are not always comfortable providing those kind of public goods. How do we leave them in, like the wrap them up on the campus here? Uh, that, the other one is the Upton Meadows Primary School, that Upton, it went in first. So people, when they moved in, could use the local school instead of commuting by car to another school. That helped build up community cohesion in the same way that shops, the local services, surgeries, and things like that do. It's really tough to build a community that's building one of the expansion of Chelmsford and Essex. Um, I have to say, there were several groups, and when the group of men did it, they just stuck all the infrastructure down, the roads and the pilots, and they didn't think about the community. This was a group of women, and the whole thing was built inside out uh, as a community, as a real thing community community. I have to be careful where I say this, because some of them were very offended, the men were very offended when I said that, but the more people would want to live in the one that the group of women built than the one that the group of men built, which had roads, and uh, really a means of getting out, but no desire to live there. And it's not, sorry, that just comes an accident of gender, it's, I've just, I just got to quote it. But a lot of it is about how we put these things together in places and neighborhoods, ideally that are walkable by people who don't have uh, vehicles that are going to get out. So whether it's, it's in the Dalmarnock hub near the station, whether it's uh, on corners or streets or squares, this is the, the part of the thinking for uh, Graham, the Aberdeen one, the Bridge of God, drawing upon traditional precedent. I just want to say something about the people part, because it's a little bit about a process of place making, but here some of the key questions are, who is the client? Who is the paying client? But they may not be the ultimate end user client. Even the initial occupiers 
may not be the end plan. So think about loose fit places that might have multiple clients and users. What skills and disciplines may we need in the process to build this up? What baseline material and assessment criteria? You heard Brian said at the end that he gave you the seven key points. And when do we engage with different players from business, from community, from civic groups, and so on? And is the whole method deliverable? So the client could be any one of those, and quite possibly all of them. Even though the paying client could be the council or the developer or government or some kind of amalgam, all of those community players, agencies like the health players, police, and so on. They can all be part of the client, the users of the master plan space. And then that means that the range of skills you need are not just planning, architecture, urban design, it could be uh, landscape, or sometimes it's an artist. Different kinds of transport design skills. Property, geotechnical, what's under the ground? Is there anything contaminated, poisonous, and risky? And understanding cost and community engagement. It's a bit about community engagement at the moment. So there are a whole range of things you may need to understand what's on the ground, what's happened in the past, what data and evidence is around. Now that's very hard if you're building in a green field and there's nothing there. But a lot of the time you're inheriting place evidence and statistics and experiences from people. And you've got to capture that in some way. So in terms of engaging people, stakeholders of different types, sizes, experiences, and where people come from and what their experiences in the past have been is important. There's a listening stage early on, getting to people, hearing their views, ideally before you formulate much in the way of a plan or, or, or apply options. But people can then get involved in midway with their options and they start to believe in the possibilities around them. And then perhaps if you're lucky as you move towards some kind of shared vision or shared plan or shared strategy, you can get endorsement if you've done the other steps. And you might even get some of the community being advocates of the plan or the business community being advocates as we find when we did the Royal Mile. But you've also got to share language and cut across barriers. When we did one of our assurance and attend center, and I was talking to a little girl, we, we went to help it from parents, we also went to the school children. Nicola, who was eight, said to me, Kevin, um, I know you're going to draw it up, but uh, I, I don't know what you're going to do. I said, look, if you tell us, we'll draw it, and we'll do different options, and we'll see if it fits your aspiration. She said, oh, well, that's easy. We just need a new blue for the time set. It'll be much better. And I said, okay, but this is telephone. I said, do you want the car park improved, or the shed box retail, or do you want new things? And he said, well, she said, I just need a new look at it. It'll be much, much better. I said, but tell us, and we'll draw it for you. And her friend said, Kevin. Uh, right, we didn't know at the time. Telford now has a new look. The shop doesn't look any different. <laughs> so there are issues of language and community, old and young, to address. The idea is that the different elements of the master plan process link interconnectedly equally with the input from the community and the different players. And then sometimes when you've gone places where people are not comfortable talking, and we've had that in some places where there have been uh, riots, sometimes even race riots or communities calling out, you, we can build up uh, storytelling processes that draw our aspirations and needs. Because as we heard at the beginning, some kind of clarity of local understanding feeding into and informing the vision and goals is critical. You can't do that as outsiders, as architects, as planners, as engineers, as politicians, if you haven't listened to people. And then you involve the local people in the testing and the review. You test it as a plan, but also you're testing on meeting the principles, again, that Brian said this a minute ago, that you're trying to fit with whatever the vision principles are, are we delivering? And that review stage is absolutely critical uh, to know whether you're on track and whatever the process is <coughs> deliver. I really want to just end in some of these. Delivery is key. It's not enough to have a plan that sits on a shelf, but delivery can be taken over the pace over 5, 10, 15, years. Have you got the right players there understanding what's got to be done? Is the design control, quality control in there? Is everyone committed to playing the role and has the money been lined up or can it be lined up? <coughs> Is it in the plan? We've done so many where it's not in the statutory plan in any way and it, and it takes years to get into the plan. So those kinds of issues. Are there any risks? Is the technology there? Is the infrastructure so whether you're doing something like Prince of Wales did, I know this looks like somewhere out of 1780, 
but it's actually out of about 10, 15 years ago. Um, but it works in its own terms. Or this is the one from Bradford, and Russia the one also on. This is what Brian's firm has very successfully done in terms of delivering a new public space, what's called the, the, the city park of the Bradford and Bradford. And it's brought everyone together and it is a really uh, thriving space. The council did that through the recession, taking the master plan process over the last decade. Or here in Antwerp, where I just come back from, where they have master plan this integrating all the new development and design and spaces within an overall framework. But it's taken about 20 years, but that is turning the population and the economy of Antwerp around. For a place like Dundee or Glasgow or Edinburgh or Abney, well worth visiting Antwerp uh, to see their experience. So, is the master plan process and the outcome plan and plans, are they going to be credible and deliberate? Does the place work? Have you got the character and the feasibility of making it happen? Have you got the economy lined up? Have you got funding elements from different players? Is there enough value uplift in there and public goods being provided for people who are well off and not so well off? That range of different users, business and residents. And have those occupiers and stakeholders been involved? This was what we did in Nottingham, and the businesses who came along to our charrettes uh, from here were terrified. They thought they were being CPO'd and cleared away. And quite the opposite, we were trying to involve them in, in the process, and they ended up being able to liberate a lot of money from their own sites by redeveloping them and being part of, of a confident master plan. I just want to end it up, because I've done the, the work we did for, for Mike and, and recognize some of the colleagues in the room. It's a process. It takes years. This is back in 1998, 14 years ago, thinking about Dundee waterfront, this is the bridge, uh, and this one, the waterfront stays the same, but can we reconfigure what happens on the land? The bit where Brian said some of the things are coming down now. Could we bring water back in where the Victoria Dock was? And in this instance, could we have a road along the middle there? With a central bit? Or this, this work I did with, uh, with Willie Miller and the ambitious idea was could we actually take the bridge off at that point? take it along there. And of course, at that time, we said, no, we can't possibly go into the estuary at all. So let's rethink what are the possibilities. And this is where the phasing thinking is. The, the program is crucial. So go from there, small increments around the end, progressively build it up, reconfigure the roads, think of what's happening now, right now as you drive around, new development opportunities in urban grain emerge, and that thing can be taken forward. In that instance, the idea was to bring water back in as dock, and then uh, maybe that uh, doesn't work. Um, it, it could have other options, could there be greenery. In this instance, it was all the way to take the, the reconfigured bridge. But what we ended up with was looking first at a hard space, that then became a dock and a soft green space. And think about how Mike and his team have taken this forward over the last 15 years, taking the ideas uh, into your plan. That kind of thinking. All I'm doing with this is showing that this thinking done with uh, colleagues in, in Dundee uh, Council and other agencies, uh, Scottish Enterprise at the time, that has taken 14, 15 years to progress to where it is now. And of course, now the idea of going into the river estuary uh, to, to put the DNA museum uh, is now part of the thinking, something that was very radical at the time. So I'm not going to, I know there are lots of things on websites now. We even looked at whether we could put million millions in the space there. It takes a long time. Master planning is a means. It's a process means. It's not an end in itself. It's making successful places the end, but particularly real, vital, different places for real people, not uniform solutions that we drop down from elsewhere, that are the same as we did in Hong Kong, or the same as we did in North America. So I hope you found some interesting points in there.
policy from the Scottish government banned AP3. Are you the one who wrote the policy I believe? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. And he is the one who created method and methodology for, I would say, even design analysis. And I believe we put all his materials and books in our library. But I would like to mention some of them. The place check method of air and design project, and the skills appraisal method capacity check, and the recent one called the design appraisal method quality review. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. All right. I think the amazing thing is that six percent of master plans work because. Why do they fail? Because we're, we're trying to, we're dealing with complexity, un uncertainty, trying to uh, do things that need to be found over uh, a long period of time. Um, and things change. Uh, and it's very difficult to plan for the change. That's a problem with what we're And somehow we want, to, we want to avoid this. What can we learn from the success of the Olympic Master Plan? Uh, nothing actually. Uh, what you learn is that if you have uh, an unlimited budget, uh, unlimited political commitment, <coughs> making it work, and if it doesn't work at the last moment, you can bring in the army to sort it out. Um, your, your last plan will work. But in the other 99.999 examples of master plan, you don't have any of that. So that doesn't tell us law of the language of urbanism. Just because I wrote a, a, a dictionary uh, doesn't mean I'm a, a pedant, but I just want to give a little uh, consistency. So when I see a door saying tickets for future travel, um, I want to have a, another door saying tickets for past travel, where I get a, a ticket to Edinburgh uh, in 1873. The, in writing the dictionary, I'm almost overwhelmed by all the words that we use. Um, and I wondered if there was a, a pattern. And in fact, when we talk about these things, urban design and planning, we're actually talking about actually about ten concepts. Um, and here's the law: there are ten central concepts of urbanism. At any one time, at least one term relating to each of the concepts will be in fashion. Whenever a term goes out of fashion, at least one more relating to the same concept will come into fashion to replace it. And here, here are the, uh, the ten. I mean, it, it, it may be yeah, there's obviously rough, uh, rough categories. And the one in white are maybe what's the current in term, sustainability going out of that. Homes and Communities Agency in, in England a couple of months ago were told you must never use the word sustainability again. It's a new label. So uh, this is where I have regeneration. It used to be renewable, then it was renaissance. Um, and the fifth words that, that this, and, and they come and go, and they come and use some of them, and some of them can go right now. The neighborhood um, in England is a uh, big one at the moment, community yeah, participation or engagement or uh, whatever. And there's more some planning there. Uh, but whatever it means, it's the sum sort of concept of the process of making things happen at a local level. Um, that means that master plan is one of the most common used words in urban design. Uh, and, and it doesn't, doesn't mean very much. Without a master plan, our vision can never be achieved, uh, as Hitler said in my account. But that's part of the, the problem of the master plan is it's, it suggests uh, there's the plan, we're going to do it. Uh, end of the story. Uh, but the real world is rarely like that. Wayne Baum said, planning is the only branch of knowledge supporting to be some kind of science which regards the plan as being fulfilled when it's been completed. Uh, but sometimes, as we've seen, it does work. The Emperor master plan, and there it is, built. This is a patch of uh, South London, uh, near where I live, and then this area <coughs> has been developed for the last 20 years, and it's uh, Incredibly well connected, uh, good urbanism around it, there's a river, waterfronts, all sorts of things. Um, and 
and this is what was built over that time. Uh, four lots of lung connected development, each connected with to the, the outside world with one access point. Uh, the most absurdly pathetic, embarrassing use of a large piece of urban land. Um, and uh, this is this is a bit. I, I took this picture about 20 years ago when it had just been uh, completed, and someone in the mining region said they just spent four million pounds on uh, regenerating this this bit of it. So uh, for your benefit, I went back and re-photographed it. So that's what you get. For <laughs> 20 years of it, the burden of time. The, 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 the person who actually was responsible was the chief executive of Merton Council at the time. I asked him about it. I said, isn't that incredibly, this is the worst bit of urbanism ever anyone has created in the last 50 years. He said, we did have a very good master plan for the area. Unfortunately, market conditions changed and we weren't able to implement it. Well, as, as Kevin was saying, market conditions change. We, all conditions change. Uh, and unless the master plan can take account of likely changes. If we don't know what the change is going to be, but we know they're going to happen, uh, it's not going to work. And the trouble is we, we tend to work our master plans in immense detail. And, and as urban designers, we're, we're complicit in this because the more detail there is, there are more fees to run. But in that one we showed of, uh, of South London, you know, if you could have just fix a few things, uh, and say, well, the rest might change, but let's fix one or two things, maybe three things, that, that will make the difference between this area fitting in with the, uh, the surroundings. Um, that would be worth doing, rather than coming up with something incredibly uh, uh, sophisticated, which actually we know won't happen. <coughs> Master plan is like dentistry. When you go to a new dentist, uh, he'll look at your mouth and he'll say, oh, God, I don't know what your old dentist was doing. Uh, it's absolutely, you know, it all needs to be redone. And that's what master plans do. Whenever I hear a master plan, I say, uh, what happened to the previous master plan? And, and they say, well, that's fair. How do you know there's a previous master plan? Well, there always was a previous master plan. Um, uh, uh, it's strange that the 14th wealthiest man in Britain has uh, <laughs> not, not afforded a better orthodontist than, than me. Uh, but he, he, uh, a great deal. Uh, and, and we hear that consultants prepared last month a couple of years ago, but conditions changed so we need a new one. Uh, yeah, we decided to commission a new master plan to the uh, We have to commission our own master plan. People do this. Uh, the new political leaders, new landowners. Uh, let's commission a master plan. The Royal Docks in London keep 27 master plans for the same site. No, nobody says, uh, maybe we're doing the wrong thing, maybe it's not market plan, it doesn't work. All I want to say to you is that let's you know, keep it simple and think of what do we want to achieve. Think of three things we want to achieve that are important uh, on this site, in this place. If we have four, that may make it you know, less likely that uh, we'll achieve it. Five, a bit less more likely. So the, the more sophisticated we make it, the, the more likely maybe that we won't get in what's important. When 12 years ago, um, Kelvin Campbell and I wrote uh, the, the English time guide to find design, we kept a really clever idea which we thought we need to define all these terms. Uh, the tricky one is master plan, which is everyone uses to mean everything. So how, how do we define master plan? We thought, look, we won't use the term master plan in England's only document that I'm about to learn design. We don't use the term. And if we don't tell them that not using it, it might be that the department of Iraq, whatever it was then, won't notice. And amazingly, they didn't. And they published this document about urban design, which didn't mention, didn't use the word master plan once, even though master planning was what everyone thought of urban design was. We thought that was, because uh, we, we thought there was no point in using it, because it's so uh, vaguely used. Um, it doesn't really mean anything, and we can't define it because people will use it in every other sense, and, and that, that's, that's fine, that's what words are like. Um, <coughs> at the same time as we, uh, we wrote by design, uh, Richard Rodgers was writing his book, uh, 
towards an urban renaissance. And he was, he was an architect, and he said, every page, he said, what we need is a master plan. So everyone said, right, what we need is a master plan. So people still thought about master plans. So then a few years later, I was writing another book about for the urban design group. And again, what we need to define is things. And this time, I thought, well, I will define master plan. Um, uh, and I thought, well, the thing about a master plan, really, if we're getting serious about master plan, this should be the sort of thing, it's not just a, a, a general urban design framework seeing what possibilities are for developing now. The master plan is the, the document probably that uh, goes into the details of programming, funding, uh, timing, uh, that could probably only be done by you know, somebody who controls the site. Uh, this is getting you know, the serious end of urban design guidance. And to me that made sense. When I was commissioned to write the, the, the panel master planning, uh, I said to the Scottish Government, well, I wrote it in the first draft that said, that defined master plan and master planning, and said, this is what the master planning is made out of, and these are the elements that tell you whether you've got a good master plan or a not a very good master plan. And then we have robust master plans, and, and they'll pretty really work. Uh, and the Scottish Government said, no, but you, know, you must realise what we're trying to do is to say to developers, house builders who are building sites, don't just draw some of your standard units on the site. Actually go to the site and have a look at it and see if there's a river running, see if it's on a slope, and, and then design it according to that. And that's master planning. So we wrote this document, which is not free it's a way to say master planning is important. If you're a developer or a house builder, you should be master planning the site, not just sticking down to the standard unit. Uh, it doesn't say what a master plan is, so if you want to know, then you won't find it. Uh, and we've probably now got to the point where we could do with some guidance and actually say what a, what a master plan actually is, and how you tell the difference between a, a good master plan and a, and a bad master plan. And I think uh, Kevin was telling us a lot of the, the elements that would help you judge what's, what's in this stuff. Uh, uh, so they all look similar master plans. Here's one by One Size Fits All Associates, uh, and this one, Tailing Made for Site Associates. And they're very different master plans, but just by looking at them, um, I mean, you, you can't tell. And here is, I say we need a definition. Well, here's a definition of a master plan. And as we've heard, you know, we're talking about a process, not just a document. So it's a strategic guidance document. Um, and it's strategic, it's not just looking at that particular site. And, and it, it's recording a process, it's not, a, it's not just an image of an arrangement of some buildings. We're, we're telling the story through this document, it's, it's getting us to that. Um, and it's a collaborative process that involves a lot of people. And that's its strength, because we need to make things happen, we need to have a lot of people being involved, working together to find the common ground. It's also the, the difficulty, because there's a lot of uh, conflicting interests. So we need to be clever as to how we make that collaboration work. It's a multidisciplinary process, it's not just a um, uh, you know, one professional or one type of professional coming with their vision. We need professionals with vision and <coughs> capability, uh, but we also need uh, professionals who can work together and who can work with non-professionals. Uh, we need to formulate planning and design principles, uh, and it's not just it's not just physical things, it's not just buildings whole range of different things. If we're talking about placemaking, that's not just about things that you can draw or photograph. It's how places work, uh, how people are educated, how, how, uh, uh, how they get in state of it. Um, but there is, we are concerned about the three-dimensional physical form because we think that's a powerful way of expressing some things about placemaking uh, and showing how an area can work. Um, and we're concerned about how they're implemented which is how a lot of the uh, the 94 percent uh, fall down because they don't get part of it because things change or because actually working out what can we implement and how all these things work together is incredibly complicated and especially if we make a master plan in a process that is incredibly complicated and if we forget actually we've got to try and keep it as simple as possible and uh, have some things that are uh, simple easy to focus on Yeah, I, I did some, some training in a, in a, a town in the east of England, which you'll uh, be 
name, but let's call it sentiment friction. Uh, and at the end of it, a uh, uh, policy planning came. We spent the day walking around the town. And it's a town along on two rivers. It grew up with the two rivers over there, and, and its industry and its activities uh, were focused on the river. And, and in time, uh, those interests have faded away. So there's lots of sites along the river, the two rivers. Uh, and it's amazing. They, they just, uh, uh, as always, they don't mind you looking into shop for some reason. 
simple ideas about how you make streets and some awareness that like what we try to do here, we're, we're trying to make some uh, some streets that feel like the traditional streets of, of Glasgow. Uh, and of course the reason it happened was because various institutional things, the, uh, the role of the development agency, continuity, uh, and, and so on. So I think that the, the master plan is a true road. And, uh, and at some point they said, well, we're going to have the modernist bars or the heritage bars. In 
looks very odd. It looks absolutely ridiculous. It destroys all the um, potential that that village green. No reason why it should be like that. It could be that the, the development could be faced off the green and it could be a real successful place. So sometimes in your master plan, you just need to felt the pen and try and draw a few very simple diagrams, a few lines uh, to test whether anybody has thought anything seriously about how it's going to be as a place to live. And just to finish, um, I've been working recently on um, a place check which, uh, for the charity, which I've been working on for 14 years. And the more I work on it, the, the less there is, and, and English heritage pays us to, 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 to develop it. And we go back and say, there's even less of it than there was when we started. And they say, is this what we paid? And we say, yes. Um, because the idea of place check is this. You, you go out and do a, a simple walk around. It's, 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 it's nothing new. And, and you ask uh, Fife, um, this is how to do a, do a place check. Choose an error, spend an hour or so. I walk about, ask, what do we like about this place? What do we dislike about it? And importantly, what do we need to work with? Uh, because I've spent so much time in, in participatory processes incredibly productive of, of information and ideas and visions uh, which just swamp us and, and lead us to think, hey, we're going to, this is what we're going to create. Um, and what I love about place and, and the, the less that there is in it, the, the, the better it seems to work. We just focus on this one question, really, of, and what do we need to work on? Not with this, not, not so, what's somebody else going to do, but what's important enough to us to, to work on, and then ask you some questions. Okay, how are we going to? Um, yeah, who needs to be involved? It's not just us. It's other people we need to get involved. Um, how are we going to organise ourselves and get organised with other people? Um, how are we going to identify some some things that we can do immediately? But we don't need a master plan for We can go out and do it next week to improve the area, uh, and then thinking about um, improving improving the neighbourhood. But to me, that's the place to start thinking about the master plan, asking some very basic questions, and then saying, okay, let's see if we can make it more sophisticated, uh, draw in more people, and uh, make the possibility of more things happening. But rather than starting with a wonderfully inclusive, uh, elaborate document, which actually isn't ever going to be achieved, as a nine to so um, I'll leave you with a preview of the the RIBA's uh, uh, new publication. Um, uh, but finally, a, uh, an inspirational slogan that I would like to uh, leave, leave you with. Uh, Give a man a fish and you feed him for a day. Teach him to fish and you feed him and his family for a lifetime. Teach him to plan and you wish he'd show him the fish. <laughs> <laughs>
an age of austerity with very little public resource and frankly very little private activity, oh, we can still prioritize master plans where it matters. And this is to be absolutely fundamental that we do, or else we fall back in the ad hocery that we still will stop. Okay. Big statement. Okay. Now, kindly, if anyone would like to ask any questions, just, just say who you are and we are in front. Okay? Questions? Okay, fine. Brian Adams, School of Architecture. Thanks. I showed Brian Adams, School of Architecture. Rather than ask a question, I wouldn't mind making an observation. I was a king here today, and I'm pretty cynical of the whole process of planning. And I've been pleasantly surprised by the content of the three speakers. I actually enjoyed the three of them. And I think you've touched on some interesting issues. Uh, and I would hate to be involved in master planning. I've done a lot of it in the past. And last night I went, had to went over Google to check some of the times that I worked in maybe 20 years ago. And I'd go, oh my Christ, why did we do it? And you know what I'm now celebrating in terms of the whole process that we're in a recession. I actually think it's, I don't think it's a recession. I think we're in a transition to a new future. And for me, maybe it's going to bring some hope and, and bring real values because I think, and particularly the last speaker made a wonderful comment about the Olympic Park. And I think that's so true. There was a lot, I think there was a lot of understanding behind what you said. I would love to talk about it. And I think there's just so much pish that's been perpetuated <laughs> in our total society. It's awful. And, and I think, no, I'm not saying by you guys at all, I think by you know, buzzwords of political correctness and whatever, and government and semi-government and semi-state organizations, and maybe, maybe the recession, I, I would love to hear your views. Do any of you see that this recession of transition as being positive? Oh, we'll start at the top of the, the, the microphone. I mean, I, I, I think, to me, the recession doesn't really make any, obviously makes a, a, a real difference in many ways, but it, it, the, the conditions are always strange, and, and, and what we have to do is try to make things work in difficult conditions, and that's what planning is, and the other reason we do planning is because planning should be able to make things work that wouldn't otherwise work, and, and there's always things happening, there's always compromises to be, to be made, there's always things that can happen if you're clever and if you work out what resources you've got and how do you make them work together. Um, so uh, I think uh, it, 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 it's, it's more difficult, but in a way, you know, the, when, when things are going well, what we do is just do lots of master plans that, uh, that, aren't, um, uh, that aren't implemented. But we've got lots of money to do them, and we've got money to do the next one. Now, now we haven't. Um, so we need to say, okay, we're going to find ways of doing things that won't cost a lot of money, and, and we're going to do something that, uh, that we don't have any expectation that there's any certainty, so we're going to work out what's important uh, and what we want uh, in, in any circumstances. Um, so, uh, and, and so I think you know, the same skills and the same processes is needed, um, and, uh, and, and, and actually it's, you know, it can can avoid the, the, the problems you get when you expect the market to solve everything. Yeah, well, I agree. I, I have those five criteria up at the end, uh, and I meant to say and didn't say that I haven't mentioned money. Um, but I actually think money gets in the way. It's not a lack of it, it was too much of it. Um, and I never actually think about it anymore because it, it just gets in the way of a timeless way of building. So I mean, I do completely agree with you all. Um, the situations are complex, and actually the solutions are often fantastically simple. And you just clear away all of that complexity. Um, in terms of your transition point, um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's probably true. I mean, we go through cycles, and we go through transitions, and I think when you're when you're living through a paradigm shift, it's quite hard to figure out, um, you know, what you're going to. Um, and a lot of us, a lot of us spend a lot of our time trying to figure that out. Um, I, I think um, my latest take on this was I had a studio meeting in the office the other day, and I, I said, look, can we talk about the new normal, please? 
because um, we're, we're kind of here for a while, and I actually think there's there's immense opportunities if we can all keep body and soul together, um, while our politicians are comprehensively um, caught in the headlights uh, and don't know what to do with their uh, even the financial mechanisms that are of their own making, um, <coughs> then then you know if we can do that, we can we can do an immense amount of good work and, and, yeah, and we thankfully have systematically uh, ramped back some of the, um, some of the um, aspiration behind things and strip out all the silver bullets and the, uh, you know, we were working in Gervin recently and, and somebody had sold them what they needed was some multicultural, multifunction um, swimming pool. Um, quite elephant, looked like a poached egg. Um, actually, uh, poached egg on the beach, <laughs> and they, 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 that's what they need, like a hole in the head in the government. So, a town of 8,000 people, and I'm sure it'd be nice for them to have access to a swimming pool. I, I mean, they've got the North Atlantic, you know, just there. Quite as much water as you could possibly ever want, really. But hey, the thing we need, is what we need is heated water, right? Anyway, I'll get carried away, get carried away. interested in this idea of transition, particularly in the context of some recent consultation exercises that have been in, involved with, which are to do with the Scottish Government's um, proposals for community empowerment. Because I do wonder, you know, in terms of placemaking, it may be an interesting way to start to look at things, is how, how people that live in the place, because I'm mostly involved in development of neighbourhoods where people live, how they can, you know, how they start to control the public realm and spaces around their houses, how they might want to use them, what they might want to, to actually do with them, in the, you know, in a very positive state, in a sense. And at the moment, people are, are very involved in community gardens and community orchards and gardening projects, because it's quite an easy thing to do to occupy the space. But I do wonder if maybe the master planning process you know, as a process and not as a kind of di you know, a kind of diagram. The master planning process really needs to start to consider who controls these spaces and how people use them and what people can do in them, you know, in a very positive way that perhaps assists with small scale grassroots economic development and regeneration. So I think the, the, this sort of period of change actually is could potentially quite a positive one. Because I think, uh, you know, what's come out of this community um, empowerment consultation uh, exercises and workshops is that there's a kind of uh, push and pull in the public sector and, and people that occupy spaces as to who is in control of those outside spaces and what we should be doing with them. And the public sector doesn't really want to go, and the, the people that live in the area don't quite know how, how to do things in these spaces. But I think, you know, that situation has a lot of scope to, to, to start to do very positive things without involving um, complex processes in a lot of money. Sorry, I just had a couple of points. Um, lots of the nicest places, townscape wise, have not had lots of development in the peak waves of the boom. That London or Edinburgh, Glasgow may have had or big cities. And a lot of our, in the Academy of Urbanism, a lot of the times that win awards have just kind of gently come back. So this idea of not being part of the boom and constant change, particularly demolition and, and bad buildings. I mean, I, last year our practice was involved in a plan for Kilmarnock. One of the interesting things about Kilmarnock is it doesn't actually have lots of bad buildings. It didn't have the, the, the market-based boom. Uh, or the public sector boom in quite the, way, the same way that other places did. And it, it's had economic problems, but the physical landscapes kind of quite interesting. But the recession does mean the point at the beginning about front end planning who pays for the upstreaming of master planning? Is it the public sector? I don't think so, certainly not alone. And the private sector, the developer side, 
no, they're not doing it. They still want to do get their permissions cheap and easy, so it on. It tends to be, if you look at the SSCI projects around Scotland, they're nearly all landowners or landowner promoters. So there is an issue about this front end, you know, who, who then it gives power to. And I'm really intrigued looking at the leading examples from around Europe of Freiburg, of how the council there engages with land and landowners. And recently, I uh, showed Antwerp. Antwerp does a Flemish version of slow urbanism. And I think, take a look at that. It's small increments of investment of change that the community are involved in and can accommodate. So it's a pace of change that's gentler. That's at a, a kind of city level, but it can be done. It's very appropriate for small uh, places as well. Um, and finally, we go off next week to study Lisbon. In Lisbon, they have no money, they're broke. But they do a thing called participatory budgeting, where the community are involved in selecting the projects from a range, they've got limited money, and they come up with 50 or 100 projects, and they all agree, these are the things we're gonna do, and, and do it together. And they'll come back with other ones the next year and the year after. They're often public realm, or environmental improvements, or neighborhood improvements. But that participated, so it's doing small things well that cumulatively build up the quality of the town and make it more livable uh, or, or, or neighbourhoods. So I think that may offer something in a recession. But the danger of the recession is we do nothing, we lose the construction skills, we lose the specialist skills, we lose the design skills, we lose the participation skills if we do nothing. So we've got to somehow keep going forward and passing on the skills and qualities to the next generation. Another question. Having said I wouldn't say anything, um, and they're about to say something. Can I first put a quick summary? I'm Mike Galloway, I'm the Director of City Development here in Dundee. Um, just an answer to that previous question, I actually think the implementation of master plans is something that is actually best done in a recession, because there's complete market failure, you've got political will behind you to actually create construction jobs, um, contractors are desperate for work, you can do more with your money, and that's why we're benefiting from that in Dundee at the moment. And if we manage to pick up the upturn in the, uh, in the development cycle, then we'll have hit the jackpot. So in some ways, now is exactly the right time to be doing it. But that's not my question. My question is that I think the contributions this afternoon were absolutely excellent. Very uh, um, accurate insight into the whole master planning process. We, of course, of course all get the importance of um, creating a shared vision and about how you generate that shared vision and the involvement of stakeholders and the public. What I want to ask about is the role of the charrette in that process because I've been personally involved in a, a large number of charrette type processes. I've been put a lot of sweat and tears and blood into that process. I have come to the conclusion that by and large it's a contract that depending on who you have at a particular charrette on a given day, you will get a different outcome. Or will you? Are we going into that as professionals, as value-free technicians that are there to release public desire and will? Or are we there to shape that will to what we wanted all along? And all too often I've seen the latter rather than the former. But I'm not actually sure that that's a bad thing. So I'm. I would challenge the role of the charrette, and I'd like to hear your view on that. It's an interesting uh, point of view, Mike. Um, and uh, my charrette experience is relatively limited. I went across to Loch Gelly and enjoyed the process that was conducted there. I found it very, very interesting and very useful because. One had neglected places like Loch Gelly and the possibilities of frankly transforming them. As to whether Loch Gelly will ever be transformed, I've got an open mind. But but I did notice um, a few when we undertook an assignment um, for Tormagree. Uh, Tormagree is a new town project up in uh, Murrayshire. Uh, Tormagree was designed actually by the same fellow who was involved in Loch Gelly way back in approximately 2006, um, using a, a charrette process uh, at the time. Uh, this year, I think it's now got uh, consent and principle 
so there's been a huge gap between public consultation, community consultation, and actually achieving uh, regulatory consent, and that, that only at, in the in principle stage. So that would tend to bear out the uh, the notion that charrettes can be a con because we can't deliver quickly enough uh, through from uh, getting public will and interest to actually execution. It does go back to this is issue of well, who actually are going to be the movers and shapers of development, and landowners are absolutely fundamental to that. Uh, yeah. Um, it, it's, um, I, I mean, you, you, it, it's good, Mike. You, you posit a very, uh, um, you, you posit the nub of the matter. I mean, it is somewhere between um, a process of integrity and three card monte. And, and, it, and it, it's, um, it would be wrong to deny otherwise. Um, I, I think that, like everything else, it demands a degree of integrity. Um, I, I certainly believe quite clearly um, that, that uh, there is an onus of responsibility on those who run Shiraz with communities. Um, and maybe I could separate out Shiraz process for design. Um, where you're, uh, you do it internationally and you do it over a week, but you're not engaged with the community necessarily. Um, and the ones which I much prefer, where you are engaged with a com with a community and, and you're um, and you're doing something. So there's a de there's definitively a degree of integrity requirement in the process. Secondly, um, there's there, as I mentioned, there's a degree of leadership, and um, I think it's possible in some instances. Um, it is it is a contract to bring people to an answer that they should have been at, or, or that you want you have a predefined idea about where, where you wanted them to get to, and I think with some people that is the case. Um, I'm a bit less convinced, I think, about the um, uh, you know about whichever group of people you had on a particular day, you get a different answer. Um, if the community activation in, in, in advance of the um, in advance of the charrette is well done, and therefore there has been outreach to the schools, there have been outreach to community groups, there's been outreach to the local press, um, there, there's, and, and that, that community is activated and you bring them along, uh, and you approach that process with integrity, then, um, then, then I think uh, you and you do you don't seek to impose your will on that, but you seek to use your skill to interpret that and build solutions in response to that. But then I think it can work. But it, I mean, there is a danger that it falls it falls into the hands uh, of of charlatans, or it becomes a commoditized process. Um, and, and I think that, that that's something of a worry for me. One, one corollary, um, which we haven't talked about, which I think is relevant, is I also think it happens to demonstrate good value for money um, and good value for time. Because in my experience, you, you can move the process along a lot faster uh, in that way than you might with a, with a, with a conventional process. So you get, a, you get activation and studying in advance, you have a charade where you've got a lot of people working tra transparently with local people and they see that uh, working process and, and they see that reflected back to them. You, you can accelerate the program and because you accelerate the program, uh, I think there's, a, there's an issue of delivery con contingent on that, um, when you talked about uh, 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 the example up north, then, then I think you can do it. So I, I am waiting to the process because I think if you if you're a professional with integrity and you know about all the things that we've all been talking about and Kevin and uh, Rob in particular expressed very coherently and, and, and clearly and cogently, you can release that in a local community um, and you can work through those. But but significantly in respect of, 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 of Kevin's concluding points, um, you can particularize the outcome rather than rather than it being a, a more generic uh, response, and I think that's one of the benefits of it as well. So, so I am waiting to it, but I, but I think I think your your uh, you, you in your in your artfully constructed question, you, you did 
you did posit the challenges and, and you did posit the dangers of it? Uh, I think it's like any tool that urban designers use. You know, a pencil can be used to, to help manipulate people, but you, you don't blame the pencil, you blame the people who are, who are doing it. And I think one thing about charades is it, it tends to concentrate um, the process, as uh, Brian says. Uh, and I, if you don't use a charade, then the same deals and the stitching up and uh, uh, the, the things that go on, but they happen, happen maybe over months or years, uh, so maybe you don't notice them. So a charrette is probably easier to manipulate, but it's also maybe also easier to see what's going on. Oh, I was talking to a developer a, a few weeks ago about some uh, facilitators, uh, and, and I was saying how useful uh, that they could be. Uh, and he sort of got the wrong end of the stick, and he said, yeah, I find uh, facilitators wonderful. He said, uh, uh, with the right facilitator, I can get the community to believe design and absolutely anything. Um, I, I think um, that charrettes are a, quite often an opportunity for a wonderful piece of theatre. I think there is an element of sort of choreography that does go on. And I think really, that's not to say that they aren't a really good tool for people to use, but I, but I think what you have to think about is where the charrette slots into perhaps the planning system and who's involved in the charrette process how it's maybe evaluated, how if there's any degree of assessment, and, and how you move on from the charrette, because a charrette as a piece of theatre and a sort of political tool is one thing, a, ch a charrette's part of a, an evolving process is something else altogether. Does everyone know what a charrette is? It's a crown. It's four to eight days come from chariot, uh, from Beaux Arts 100 years ago. If it's less than four to eight days, you're not going to cover enough ground, but it can cover four months' work or eight months' work if you're working intensely with enough, often including through the night. Mike's right, there's a huge risk, but the benefit is, unlike lots of other things like workshops, we do workshops, we do loads of different kinds of events, different scales, there is drawing. And there is something about drawing. If it's honest drawing, there's a conversation. And usually what people say is draw what people want and, and uh, interrogate and explain. The open evaluation and review is important, particularly if it's done on tracing paper and butter paper. People, it's not an exhibition. You can see that it's a working process and you can see that people are involved. But if it is manipulated, there's a problem. Sorry, often we split, instead of a six or seven day charrette, we'll have three two day workshops, a couple of months apart. So we can, we decouple. The issue is the charrette works if you're flying in consultants from abroad or another part of the country, it's cheaper. And, and there is an issue there where it's often the charrette is used by American, Australian consultants flying around the world. There is something about it fits for them. We don't have to use that all the time in Scotland. We can use different means if we're using uh, lo local people. Um, neutral facilitation is important. I've just been out talking about this in Hong Kong, trying to train them up because it's a different approach out there. Neutral facilitation with values. We get used, often if we're working as facilitators, we're not planners, we're not urban designers, there's different, you know, we're working with Farrells at the moment on something, we play a different role, and you're effectively community advocates and, and you're acting in community planning. So I think the values and the principles and the guidelines, everyone signs up at the beginning of the charrette to a set of values and a set of ground rules. And I think that's the way around some of the, the perspective manipulation. <coughs> Question from the students. Architecture or planning? Hina. Hi, I'm Hina. I just finished my MC. Uh, I would like to know about, as you say, the Sharif is a part of masculine process. And I would love to know about how you describe the Sharif as a Big Bang theory sort of thing. Uh, how do you describe shared hangover and what happens next, you know, if it is not done properly? Uh, I'm not talking about expression or the after, but once what happens in like the uh, Scottish government, um, how does it work after it finished the contract and team changes? Do you think does it deliver the vision? This is my favorite student, by the way. 
And I'll give you a, something that's related to this, and it's been troubling me for some, for some time. And it relates to how does the statutory authority relate to the charrette, particularly the charrette has been developed, brought forward by uh, the landowner. Uh, because what the landowner is interested in is getting an adoption, you know, consensus about developing their site, their, their, their area. The question is, how is the local, local planning authority going to respond to what comes out of this process? And I'll go back to Tornagreen because it's an interesting example. Tornagreen is a new town proposal for about 10,000 people population to be developed over about 30 years. There's nothing, there's not a single house uh, there at the moment. There's a ha few habits exist, few houses existing there, but there's no new development there at the moment. It's a greenfield site. Tornagreen developed a master plan. It consisted of a strategic policy framework, a development framework, uh, design guidance on neighborhood plans, design codes, uh, etc. It was a very comprehensive master plan. The, a, the full regalia you'd have thought that a local planning authority would want. Quite sensibly, in my view, the local authority did not automatically give full planning consent or even outline planning consent for a new town of 10,000 to be developed over 30 years. I mean, that would be like signing a blank check. So the issue becomes um, how and when does the local planning authority get involved? If you want, that, that's, the, that's the issue of what, what happens post, post charrette. And the, the answer to that really, and this didn't happen in the case of Torna Green because it was you know, early early stuff, 2006, you know, people still thinking about these new urbanism ideas. But, but the local planning authority and the landowner, the person who was promoting the show, presumably should have had a dis serious discussion and said, what are we going to do with the outcomes of this development master planning process? What kind of master plan? You know, do we, do we want simple development framework or do we want to go to the point of design codes, etc.? How are we going to, what are we looking for, and how are we going to process it through the statutory system? And that would have speeded things up. I'm not actually critical of Highland Council. I think they've done a, actually a very good job with respect to the tolerance because they've broken some safeguards. Uh, but but it, it, it challenges you. It challenges planners to think of how will they use these design tools how will these, how will they relate the statutory system to these design tools? Because it's absolutely critically important that you don't sign on to something which is detailed to the point that, that there is very little mobility. And that's what happens when you get design codes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I start with a hangover point? There is a hangover, normally because the team have gone out in the last night and kind of forgotten the week that's happened before. And it's crucial they then write it up as a true record on behalf of the community, and, and that gets used going forward. In terms of the process, on the Aberdeen one, we went straight to the council. So when we submitted to SSCI, went to a charrette, um, we've already been discussing it with the local authority, go, and we partnered with the local authority and set it up with them all the way. And, and our, we were pivotal in trying to get it into the plan. In other words, unless you're aligning with the plan, and I did put up a, a, my criteria, unless you're aligning with the plan, you could be wasting everyone's time. Um, I think that the, the, there is an issue of the safeguards. I think the system of codes is great, and to some extent these have been re-imported. When Mike did Crown Street years ago, Mike Galloway, they were trying to reintroduce feudal superior roles and codes. This is ancient ways of doing which they've just been outlawed in Scotland. These are historical ways of doing things. So we've been importing through codes the way Americans and Australians uh, tend to do this. We should have a twin track system where there's a rigid system of something that's approved and we should be able to be flexible as well. Otherwise, there's no certainty. 
what we've done away with, unfortunately, in the Scottish planning system is simplified planning zones, which would have allowed that both to have a fixed system and an alternative and flexibility. And it generally means we have to do everything twice, two times, three times. The recently approved um, uh, Torn Green one, I think, is the third or fourth plan. So, so the, it almost means if you think you're doing it quickly, saving time, saving money, you actually end up doing it two, three, four times, way going through the same ground. So there is a system, our, 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 our legal system of planning is not as flexible as some people think it might be to be beneficial. Um, I have to say, I'm an architect, I'm not a planner, and, I, and the Scottish planning system seems to be something that's hugely complicated. And, and it's a process that's, that's continues over a particular time scale. And it's how the Charette, how the Charette meshes in with that process, I don't know. It's a Charette, I think, is a place-based exercise, whereas an awful lot, it seems to me, a, a, a Scottish, Scottish plan legislation and policy is, it tends to be much more generic, and it tends to be about particular issues rather than what's best for a certain place. So for example, you get policies that are about car parking or you know, landscaping you should have, or <coughs> children's play area you should have in a particular area. And a, a charrette kind of barges into this kind of generic policy making process in a way that I, I don't understand how the, the planning system then takes that on and, and, turn, and, and sort of simulates it into Well, I think one of the strengths of the show is that it it's can enable a lot of uh, creative public participation to take place in a, in a short time. Uh, but only a certain amount of the, the process is going to be able to concentrate, be concentrated into, into a charrette. And uh, it's important that the participation happens all the way through, not just in, in the days of a, a charrette, because uh, a lot of other people will have their uh, input uh, at other part, parts of the process. And, and when uh, the master plan is prepared without a charrette, which is uh, also common, you often see the, the, the participation process of the master planning process identified, which in fact people need to be uh, involved all the way through from the very early stages of thinking, well, what's the, what's the uh, master plan about? Who needs to be involved? Uh, the, the research, the appraisal stages, the, the options, not just at some point in reviewing the options, and then into the implementation of being involved in the processes that will deliver it and, and make it work and make it manage. So, uh, I think the test of a really good master planning process is whether those participation processes have really been thought through. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Rob. Um, Charette, um, Charette hangover comes about when the people who receive the output of the Charette don't have the capability to address the issue that Raina uh, raised. It's perfectly possible to reconcile the output of a charrette with criteria-based policy, but you have to know how to do it. Um, it's also entirely possible to pick up on uh, and take the output of a charrette that is, that is related to uh, what statutory policies and plans say, what the market will tolerate, and what the community aspire to, but you have to know how to do it. If you've got a brain tumor, you get in a brain surgery, but you don't just hand it to, you know, Jimmy and say, get on with that. And all too often, that is what happens, and nothing happens, and people get pissed off. And it's the single biggest issue I have with the um, uh, SSCI processes in Scotland. Um, I, I laud the Scottish Government for what it did by trying to create some culture change in the planning system. I laud them even for um, uh, bringing in some, some messiah uh, in Cuban heels uh, and uh, fancy three-piece uh, tweed suits that he picked up when he came here to, um, to spin the process up 
and I laud the fact that we have taken it to its next phase. They have comprehensively failed to address and put in place the capability um, to reconcile the issue that, that Rowena has, has indicated. But there are people in this country, in Scotland, who know how to do it. Some of them are in local authorities, some of them are in developers, some of them are in consultancies. And would to God the bloody government would get those people in, marry them up with the communities to pick up on the output of the charrettes and carry them through because that is the single biggest issue. And the next thing we're going to hear is this has been a great waste of time. All has happened and therefore we tried that and we don't do that anymore. And we will blame the pencil and not the process that's been, that's been related to it. And I think that is a central fundamental issue. And I'm so pleased you've asked that question because I'm going to write to the buggers next week and, and tell them that that's my experience of the charrette process. Last questions from undergraduate students. Are your architecture all blank? No problem. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, ask a little bit more about the place check um, you talked about. Um, from my architectural background, uh, that, that sounds to me like a site analysis. What I would do, I would go to a site, look at it, say what I like, what I don't like, what needs to be changed, what's happening there. Is that then just you doing that? Or are you asking lots of people to go and do that for your site? So you're getting like, almost asking them like a questionnaire and getting their feedback to what they like and don't like about the site. I quite understand that. Yeah, it's, it's not so, well, anybody can do it. So, um, and as you say, there's, there's nothing Nothing to it, but what, 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 where it's really powerful is just where you know, a group of people, you know, half a dozen people, ten people, um, wander around their area, and they just ask them those questions. Uh, and, and, and you know, it's it's so obvious, uh, but the thing is, you know, it's it so rarely happens. Uh, and and I find it, I've done lots of them, uh, and just as a as an observer, because the, the thing about place it doesn't have to be facilitated or or there. Because all they need to have is three questions. Um, uh, and there's lots more questions on, on the website, but actually people don't need those. Um, and uh, people wondering about um, asking those questions and looking at the area. And if they don't know the area, then they can see with their eyes. And an enormous amount of stuff comes out because everyone has an amazing experience of places, even if it's not that place. And if, if they do come from that place, or some do, they have an amazing amount of experience of either <coughs> history or how it works or how their children experience it or how different people experience it. And, and, and a, you know, it's just one of the, the, the facts of the plan to me, the most amazing, is that incredibly sophisticated analysis and discussions come out of nowhere with a very little uh, organization. You, know, you just have to say, it's a place check, and almost that's enough. And, and you know, I find it embarrassing because I've spent years developing all these questions and I didn't say, forget about the questions, all you need to say, just go around the area. You don't need to say, you know, what do you like around this place? Because, you know, if, if people are going to spend an hour walking around the place, you, you can't stop them saying what they don't like, what they like, what they dislike. So get them those questions. And all you need to say is, the, the, the third question used to be, what needs to be improved? Um, and, and we've now changed that to say what do we need to work on because there's no point to say what needs to be improved because you know the millions of things need to improve is what do we need to work on what, what we, and if, if we don't want to we we won't we, we you know that, that's so that, to me that's the, the basis of plan is saying that question what do we need to work on what do we what do we feel strongly enough to work on and and then that leads to saying well who we need to work with what you know, what are we going to do and you know who and then, then people start saying, well, you know, these people have got a budget to at all. You know, I know that someone whose job is doing that, or, you know, and then the things come together. And that's the basis of you know, the process of master planning and planning and policy making and everything. Really. Uh, but so often, you know, we don't start from we start with professionals who do much more. And, and I was at a relationship the other day in Lytham St. Downs, and they said, uh, what we have experienced, we've had, you know, the local authority, Fire District Council, says we need to do uh, an appraisal of this place. 
and the consultants who are being paid 500, well, they said 1,000 pounds a day, but maybe they're not better. 1,000 pounds a day is consultants. They come to us and they say, yeah, tell us about this place. They say, we could do it. Uh, you know, we, we could do it for a thousand pounds a day. We do it for nothing. So, yeah. Can I just add something to that, which is that it's an absolutely pivotal part of a charrette, that doing the walkabout, whether it's, in fact, even if you're doing a one day or a half day workshop, spend an hour, go out, walk around. It's the collective experience of sharing the analysis and the stories together and looking above street level, looking above the buildings, telling it could be history, it could be experiences. We, we've done a lot with canals and a lot of things and waterfronts and there are all sorts of family experiences, good and bad. That shared experience then becomes pivotal in developing plans, strategies, ideas and stories. But it's the collective. If everyone does it individually, you don't get the benefits. So there, there is a kind of therapeutic dimension to this, which is incredibly crucial. Okay, I think I'm cautious of time. Now it is hand on, if I may say, to David, who's been working so hard on the audience feedback and also the reflection of all the speakers. Hands to you, David. Thanks. Mission. If you ask a person 
how is it already different from the life? <coughs> ask basic questions. So the complexity, partly, is related to asking every question that we saw about every other thing. You can see how you Derived principles, the nice thing about it, deriving principles in the glass market, seven things, like the neighborhood said, thanks for that. And you've lived on four of them, that was the problems in the last two. We all talk about it, that that's the measure of success. I don't want to keep the eyes, I don't want to be evaluation. I said, let's do and then methods. But it was interesting in what's necessary because it's already changed. Forget the master plan for a second. The discussion for me is around change. What's needed for change? Capability, which could exist, does exist in the community already, not necessarily in our so it's kind of interesting actually that you set the agenda up front that was followed with no prompting, without a discussion, of change, briefing of change, not yet to do a commissioning, not yet to do a master body of you know. <coughs> Inside of it, all of the discussions we have had this fundamental thing around master plan as a clean process, cleaning up stuff, nice and neat, keeping you move, and master plan damage, and share and over. So the places are messy, we are messy. We messy things, we love it when we go to messy places and it's all open. There's something with the lack of order, the lack of control, and the piecing up of stuff to create the place to be like. Brian's question, the towns we love are not the towns we build. The towns we love are messy. There are consequences of lots of messy historic process, conflict, lots of tension, not clean. There's a whole lot of stuff. And then just the last session at the beginning, so I'm going to turn it back to you. And then the shared vision, you know, we talked about that idea of you kind know, of hats that was made. But we also have the shared visits. So not a plan damage, but like that. Simple things. But then we talked about the recession thing, and two different discussions came in. Is there a value in the recession to stop and think? And by explaining, there's a group part in the session to get stuff done. So if we're clear on the stuff that's good from the past that we can get done, we <coughs> pull around for opportunities around contractors and delivery. Not the bare bridges, go to the links, get them to be sorted in the sessions and students. Actually, a lot of real interest in discussion, questioning discussion, very deep questioning discussion, very bullshit. You know, so the charrette, it's our process, our charities, is their favorite, is their priority. So if somebody come out with an answer that is not yet visible, but the process makes it visible, against, in the same discussion, Real good people who are involved and in interest in bringing those sensitivities in place. Facilitation, neutral, great values. Using the same method, actually, we get very different results. So it came down to <coughs> this capability, the leadership, staying power. And then this so what? So you do your shirt, so you do your business, and then you go for a buying application. The poor buyers are going, oh my God. And you go with a bit and they go, oh my God. I thought it was all about the local. So there's all that fit in. So it's interesting around something around the effect that we have done in the past can be interesting. The democracy of discussion about change, not in a kind of very very way, very clear, who's involved methods against individual values and then how it all integrates. Again, this is just in 10 minutes, but a massive amount of stuff that's looking So moving that in, here are some things that I'm going to move to but there's something around the change process, the discussions will be moved very quickly from the last couple of process and sustainable values from our language into change. And in the change, the fundamental thing that uh, Rob was saying, that's what we do, that's what we're in. Stuff happens, stuff changes, but the master plan, if it keeps changing, means that we haven't engaged with that motion from the outset or a design or whatever we're going to keep changing. So something about what we change, meanings, terminologies, and politics, you know, so to Meaning to have one idea at one time and then you change it, then it was confused and then you move on. And actually, we never work quite good enough because everyone was confused at the end of that period. Now, um, the scope and adaptability, I worked with a guy who said that you should be able to take part in every single plan, and in that, you should be able to follow five basic lines. So basically, we took that apart and we did the follow apart a city, a town, a building, a structure. So, what are they? The last one was give you an old five plan. What are the five lines? Control. The behavior thing, it's controlling the house builder, or it's the politics of saying this, or it's the people doing that, or whatever, and ownership. And a lot of this ownership actually came down to initiation, around some community stuff, around the place making, place check stuff, around the professional integrity, around the politics, around the actions of leadership again. <coughs> and a whole lot of very useful definitions around meanings, language, obfuscation, doubt, you know, so 
So from right here, fundamentally, what do we mean with positive process and how we can get stuff? Well, we're starting to get into it, so that is good. This is a slide from a guy called Joseph Gunderman. He's from a, an architecture company called Architecture Zero Zero. I really reckon that in this new paradigm, what's going on is that we've been building on that around predictable finance, predictable governance, predictable flaky ideas. We need a kind of funny way of looking to that express the city. We need a disaster. We're now into a period which is very different, where we need to take people account of people doing stuff in the community and all of that, with people contributing time or with different forms of finance and reconfiguring how we do things. That will change the nature of the week. That will change the nature of participation. That will change the nature of financing. That will change the nature of the output. That brings us back to mess. That second thing is really messy, but actually hugely interesting. Then we got into Kevin's discussion. Quite clear, very useful, the right master plan is not an end. It's not an end. It's a means. Places are an end. People fly from the accountability issue. We're here not to mess around with shapes and colors and stuff. We're here to set frameworks for how people can live their life. So let's be real clear for the moment. Purpose. We have a good idea for So come back to my interesting what's the purpose? What is it? The vision made is a diagram of how we can basic infrastructure fits. It's about mediating it's about to deliver stuff. So so maybe here we go. Process and uh, approaches. So we have different things around the spatial map plan, it's also in space. Programming, which is also with phasing and arguably what is happening in the lead here is kind of coming together of those two and in the institutional stuff, sometimes it's a bit of freshness in the politicians putting a dark room with a large shore and a good old chat to put what's really important. You don't need to draw that, it's just the The last one then is that inside of that there are different scales of what's going on, and then there are different decisions about control. So follow back to that as maybe it's control of all the variables because that came up a number of times, you know, three of this is difficult. If you control the plot, lost it, if you control the block, you control the speed, what do you control? Why do you control it? What do you want to collapse? And that brings you into a question. On that slide, this is taken from a publication called Delivering Better Places. It's very good, it's 222 pages, so we've done a little bit of print, reaching the enemy, maybe a little space of this. It's written by uh, Steve Chisel, who was unfortunately passed away recently, Professor David Adams, and the respondent of RICS. And they looked at this whole idea of delivering change. Uh, the start of the issue around the economics of the market market. We are going to see this territory. So uh, we have somewhere a site, a place, a channel, or whatever, and we go back and change the into it. You know, we're changing lives, we're changing the place forever. What needs to be done? Number one is a leadership question, which is to do it. Let's have a chat, a democratic chat about what really needs to be done. If it's just taking a shot up, moving a bit of hope at the end of it, let's do that. So the anticipation must be able to how we're going to get there, as opposed to saying, let's have a master plan. Let's just decide what needs to be done. Next part, initiation, we're back to the leaders, and then there's a bunch of very things happening and people getting together. So there is making it real. A lot of last months have failed because it's all later. Later, when stuff happens, it will be good. It will be like before. Later, later. You will get it later. So this one's saying now, place designs about control, who controls the land, funding, who's going to give the money and design, and what is it? Next part is get shown up to take it to contracts and all that stuff. And the last one, stewardship, is worth all this time and effort. Keep it, maintain it, do stuff. The discussion around this document is that there is lots of stuff and there's two strategic things here and three tactical. The strategic one is anticipation. And that's fundamentally an issue of leadership about what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And the other one is stewardship to say if that's what we're going to do, we're going to invest in the market. The other ones are tactics. We spend an incredible amount of time in the tactics. You know, jump charts and Thank you. 
slides. And I see, you know, just, just one, I went, I finished with one of the things actually for all the time. So now it's all not limited along with the speakers and with your comments. Yes. Thanks for the speakers and the panel.